Can you, can you guys hear me? I sounded muffled. Everyone sounded kind of a little muffled. You know, like the, the teacher in, in, in Peanuts. Remember that? So uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys could hear me. I'm not really that funny, so that was my only joke for today. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Swanson. I have nothing at all to do with health, healthcare, uh, telehealth. I've actually learned so much from like the 30 minutes I was there and then the dinner before that. Um, I, uh, I don't have anything to really add. To Good job, guys. Um, so the reason I got invited to here is because uh, up until two weeks ago, I, I worked for like the largest distributed ledger related company or distributed ledger technology related company working with financial institutions called R3. Um, and I was head of market research there, looked at about 500 or so different companies in the last two years. So if there's a company out there doing something with distributed ledgers, I've probably either heard of them or have talked to them or introduced you to somebody who's done something with that. And Danny, who will hopefully be walking, walking in with a dramatic entrance, some fog or something like that, um, he, uh, his background is in data analytics and specifically around helping compliance teams at institutions uh, track bad guys that use this type of technology for, for bad things. Um, so I'm going to give you, just actually real quick, who has heard of something called blockchains or distributed ledgers? Okay. Uh, who is trying to scam people with blockchains? Anyone? Any scammers here? <laughs> I just have to ask that. So uh, this is a really, really simple presentation. Um, I didn't even add design colors or anything like that because I know you guys just want to keep it simple. So in the beginning, in the beginning, almost uh, nine years ago exactly, this paper was released on the internet on an obscure mailing list. Um, is anyone here Satoshi, by the way? Any Satoshis? <laughs> no. yeah, maybe somebody wants to be. Maybe he lives here in, in Fremont, East Bay. So, by the way, Fre if you've never, is anyone here from Fremont? It's a great city. Like, it's got a wonderful lake. So if you, once you finish today, this afternoon, go out to some of the lakes. It's beautiful. I'm not from here. Um, so the, the, this paper um, basically created a little community that's grown to be a very, very, uh, I, I want to say vocal. You guys, it's the fact that all of you aren't geeks and yet you've heard of what Bitcoin's and Ethereum and all this other stuff is, this shows you the testament of how vocal and uh, enthusiastic these people are. Um, so <clears throat> rather than go through all the technical stuff, let me just point out that the world that I came from the last few years is on a completely different side of the ecosystem. We work with only enterprises. Um, the Bitcoin world is is we, we consider more of like the retail side, the more consumer-facing applications. So we're not going to go too, too in-depth with um, the tech, but here's a, here's a really simple timeline. And um, I could just give you a quick overview of a few of these little icons. By the way, these slides, feel free to take pictures. You can take pictures of me. I'm not going to complain. Um, so you had Bitcoin released. Since it's open source, what people did is they took the code, they forked it, changed a few things, and then branded it something else. And so we call these things altcoins. There was a ton of these back in 2011, 2012, and now they've kind of had this resurgence the last year or so with ICOs. And we could talk about that a little bit. Um, by the way, any lawyers here? There was one lawyer. You actually knew that one lawyer here. <laughs> Does he go to all the events and he's just like the token guy? Okay. So, um, you also have these things called colored coins. And again, we're not going to go into the technical stuff, but I could during Q&A if you'd like to. The, probably the most second most popular or well-known platform um, in the cryptocurrency world is the Ethereum um, community. Um, they're very active, um, very fun. Actually, yesterday I had lunch with Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum. I'm not just name dropping, you can see him on my, my Twitter profile. Um, follow me. So. <laughs> The organization I'm with, we have, or I, I was previously with, uh, called R3. Uh, they launched the consortia two years ago. It's grown to over 100 members, primarily banks and insurance companies and a number of, of governments. But again, that's on the enterprise side. They're building a platform called Corda. I put that there uh, at the bottom just so you have an idea of how far since something like Bitcoin or Ethereum came around. So uh, the enterprise version, I think 1.0, was just released, I think, today of that. Um, and so that took, what, two and a half, three years after Ethereum. So they've solved different things. The red box here are some of the challenges that every type of platform and development community within those platforms is trying to solve. 
So interoperability, uh, what does that mean? Look at this, what the word means. Can, you, can these different ledgers or, or chains work together? There are several thousand of these platforms. Most of them are complete bogus scams used to, to, to grab money from people. That's why I asked you at the very beginning. Um, maybe that's how you could make some money on your side or something like that too. <laughs> Um, identity. So unfortunately for almost all these platforms, there is no such thing as an identity in the sense that you and I would recognize as an identity where you can uh, prove that somebody is somebody who they are. Uh, instead, you have all these kind of cockamamie ways of, of tying identity, real world government issued identity onto one of these platforms. Scalability. Uh, one of the challenges, and, and I guess maybe this does tie into telehealth, um, if you want something to be to reach in terms of infrastructure, reach more than one city or country or region, you have to make sure that the, the network does not collapse with that kind of transactional volume. These are the same kind of challenges. A, a blockchain at its heart is a type of network. Um, so if you have a ton of users, then you could get it you know, clogged up. So there's lots of healthy debates and unhealthy debates about that in this space. Privacy and security. This definitely ties into the world that you guys work in. You have HIPAA here in Europe you have a series of regulations called GDPR. Has anyone ever heard of GDPR? Are you a lawyer? Okay. GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, what does it do, anybody? It basically applies to every type of organization in Europe, whether or not they're small, big, profit, nonprofit, and it has to do with PII. And the same thing with these chains, these blockchains or ledgers or whatever we're gonna call these things. Since they're networks and they're holding information and this information could la potentially last forever, um, you could end up running into a variety of, of hiccups because there are laws in Europe, for example, that say uh, the right to be forgotten. It's kind of hard to forget certain data if it's supposed to last forever. So you have these conflicting issues of, of the utility of these networks uh, along with the requirements of the, of the, the parties that are trying to use them. And upgradeability. Um, you guys, you and I all take for granted, you know, my, my, iPhone, my, uh, my Android phone just upgraded uh, earlier this week. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have a smartphone, I assume. So you guys take that for granted that things take place automatically. These networks, um, especially on the cryptocurrency side, don't have automatic upgrades. They depend on actual people to upgrade that. Uh, and those people don't have like contracts. It's a, it's a public good for most of, most of that world. And so they end up arguing all day long about what an upgrade should look like. So those are some of the, the key highlights for that world. Um, I really don't want to go into too, too many technical details. Um, but I will say that um, on the enterprise side, if you guys are working with regulated institutions, just keep in mind that the requirements that they have are obviously different than what retail users or uh, regular consumers have. And one of them um, could basically be uh, when things fork. Uh, I'm not going to describe forking, it takes too long. It's not like a spoon or a knife. It means the network literally can't agree on what version of the truth is the truth. And that creates a problem if you have, say, in the financial world, if you have like a, a derivative or some kind of contract that takes 30, year to mature, 30 years to mature or 10 years or something, if the network splits, you know, what side of the fork do you support? And that's the same problem that, that takes place uh, throughout the, the cryptocurrency world as well. Um, problems trying to solve. So on the cryptocurrency side, you have basically, how, how do you move cash around? Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll be the contrarian and say that the, they've pretty much failed at competing at, with traditional um, cash, d digital cash payment systems. Who, does anyone use Venmo? Cool, does anyone use Square Cash? All right, so I'm, I'm in that, that Venn diagram with both. Hopefully you could join me someday. Um, so th those two platforms alone have, uh, on in a given day, significantly more volume and, and usage than any cryptocurrency system. Um, and that's for, there's a lot of reasons for that. For that. But the original purpose of these things was to be a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. On the enterprise side, which is what I spent the last couple of years doing, um, it's more about industry workflows. How do you remove uh, third parties, fourth parties, different entities that are not supposed to be involved or you'd rather not have involved in a trade? Um, buzzword bingo. Everyone likes bingo on Sunday night, right? 
You guys don't do big. So if you want a new bingo, you know, little table and chart, these are the words to use. Um, if you really want to, I don't, I'm looking at this red clock that's ticking down. I don't have enough time to really go through all these, but happy to talk to them in, in Q&A. Um, how would you visualize all the words I described? So if you think about a big umbrella term, I uh, think of the word ledger. Uh, then within ledgers, you have centralized ledgers, so a single database within an organization, which is what most people have or most companies have. A distributed ledger is basically taking that ledger and having it replicated throughout uh, some different geography. And then within distributed ledgers, you have blockchains, which are a type of distributed ledger. They actually have blocks and not just transactions. And then cryptocurrencies are just one type of that. Um, so rather than, I could, again, I could spend hours and hours uh, talking about this, which is exactly why you went to a telehealth conference for. So let's move on. We're going to skip that one for right now. Um, this slide, uh, everyone wants to know why people are doing these things. Why are people spending money? Um, this is the simplest, I think, graphic to explain distributed ledgers and, for example, the enterprise side. Today, or sorry, before, before you had, you know, before 1990, you basically had uh, large investment banks having a back office involving people on bicycles and stuff like that, moving documents from one bank to another and going through this very manual intensive reconciliation process to make sure trades were being settled. <clears throat> and then today, if you fast forward you know, to 20, 30 years, you do have ways to connect these different banks, but it's, it's kind of a kludge. You have these things that are taped on. It wasn't really elegant. It's kind of after the fact because none of these banks were really designed you know, 100, 200 years ago with, with, with the view of we're going to have internet packets flying around. Um, so the view uh, going forward, the ideal world, is basically getting all these silos, connecting them through a standardized shared ledger framework and getting them to shuffle that money through without having third parties. So that's the dream. Um, ask me again in a few years if that dream has come true. Let's move on. Use cases. Um, so again, these are for f regulated financial institutions. For you guys, I think probably the one that would be most relevant is maybe, uh, especially if you work with healthcare providers themselves, would be the KYC part, basically knowing your customer um, and maybe it, maybe if you're worried, maybe about money laundering, AML stuff, and that's where Danny, he was supposed to come in on that queue, did not come in. Um, but uh, yeah, D Danny's company looks at AML and where that money comes from. So for you guys who are looking at healthcare-related companies, there's actually not a whole lot um, yet uh, doing things, uh, in terms of startups, doing things with uh, distributed ledgers. Uh, but here are four. I put down, feel free to contact them or ask me to contact them for you. Um, Pocket Dot, uh, sorry, they, um, they created their own little chain and they're basically trying to uh, work with both the financial and healthcare industries. They haven't really, unfortunately, these are all very vague terms that they all use and there's two reasons for why everyone's vague. Number one, they might actually not have anything, which is probably true. Uh, and number two, uh, they probably don't want to tell the competitors what they're actually doing because then they could lose market share or something like that. Um, the one I kind of, if, if I were you, the, the, if you were looking just to talk with people who seem to at least claim to have the most traction, I, mean, I talk about the last two. Hash Health has a consortia of financial institutions that are working together to, to build a, uh, a network of, of shared data uh, that's secure and all those good buzzwords I showed you earlier. GemOS, they're down in LA. Um, actually, they're called Gem, but they sell something called GemOS to healthcare providers. So if you're, if you're just looking for two companies to reach out to and chat with about um, how are they actually applying this type of technology in the healthcare industry, I, I, would, I would look up their websites. Um, <clears throat> So this is the part that I actually wanted Danny to chat with, but I'll go ahead and dive into ICOs. Raise your hand, who knows what an ICO is? You should just leave, go to jail right now. <laughs> so an ICO uh, means initial coin offering. Um, the, it's probably the worst term to ever use because it's a play on IPO, initial public offering, and the idea here is, is you, you as an entity or as a person create a coin, you, you release it to the public, and hope that people effectively buy it. And um, there are mostly unscrupulous methods that these, this is taking place, especially out in, in China. I could go on and on. I gave whole presentations on this too. 
But there may be some legitimate reasons to do this. That's why we're presenting it, or why I want to talk about it. I don't want to be completely you know, negative Nancy. I think there's, there's plenty of good that you could do with it too. But here's, here's a straw man. Again, I'm not encouraging you to do this at this exact moment. I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards or introduce you to some lawyers um, that could. Um, so it's a really simple process. You assemble a team, you make a website, you create something called a white paper. In that white paper, you describe what this project hopes to do. Um, you basically do a bunch of marketing and you try to find some maybe accredited investors to buy into these things, these little coins, and then hopefully build an MVP, release it, and then maybe sell, uh, sell a second stage of coins to uh, a retail investors publicly. Again, I'm not encouraging you to do this, I'm just saying this is something that's currently uh, very uh, exciting for some people. Uh, here, to, to give you ideas for m amounts of money being raised, um, Actually, you see this chart, but in China alone, the first six months, it was $400 million raised this method. Um, globally, since like the last two years or so, it's about $2.1 billion. Um, and so it's a, it's a clever way of trying to get around certain fundraising laws, but at the same time, maybe there's a way you could do it legally, which I recommend you do. Um, uh, although, maybe you like jail, I don't know. So, questions, comments. Uh, by the way, Danny has not showed up yet, um, but my email is right there, Tim at Postal Clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you raise your hand, dude. Yep. Um, so could you talk about like the main benefit of doing an ICO versus, for example, using uh, like regulation 506C where you're doing general solicitation to accredited investors? Because that doesn't require a lot of paperwork like a reg A type of, type of thing. And so I'm not really seeing what the main benefit is of, of 506C versus an ICO. Yeah, sure. So number one, I'm not a lawyer. Number two, I'm not a lawyer. So I definitely recommend uh, a couple law firms in the Bay Area that are looking w to, for ways to legally do it. But the, the bottom line for why people are trying to do ICOs is non-dilutable. You're basically able to raise capital, spend it, and not have to provide any equity against that. So okay, oh, follow-up question. Let me ask one more question. So, so I guess like from the investor perspective though, um, like how would they ultimately get the return if they're buying into your ICO? So I'm being so, oh there's Danny, yeah. You, <laughs> did, well, I thought there was gonna be a fog machine. Was, I'm very disappointed. We're, we're talking about ICOs. We're talking about why should investors, what, what, how, how do they see money being returned? I, I could give an answer to that, but feel free to. to. Okay, um, the, the view is that at some point these tokens become bid up in the secondary markets, so that way over time they become 10, 100, 1,000 times higher. So it's not so much that you're buying equity in the cash flows of the company, you're buying the, the view that the, the rest of the market's going to bid up these coins in the secondary market. And one more question. So um, when the person's buying the, I mean the investor's buying the coin, are they betting on the two things, really that one, the company is going to be successful, but also that the coin is going to be increased in value, but isn't that coin like only based on that one company? Right? So the, the idea behind these ICO coins or tokens is that the, the business, that company that, that is selling that token depends on that token. They don't have any business. If the, if the token is not successful, the business is not successful. And that also the idea is that this token because it's a decentralized uh, framework, it can live on even past the company. So the company dies, other, other, if it's really decentralized and other persons are, are using it and there's economy around that, then you don't need the company afterwards. So, so people are investing in the token, the platform, and not the company, and you don't get any equity in the company. Okay, um, so let's say I do an I ICO, uh, and you're saying, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, that it's kind of independent from the company that I'm, I'm really starting in some degree. Why would I even start a company? Can I not just keep the money? <laughs> so that, that has been a problem. So I, I don't know if you've heard of the crackdown in China on ICOs. So they, they made, so China a week or two ago made ICOs illegal, and that, that the problem was that there are all these basically scammers who create a website and say, you know, we're, we're creating this token and this, you know, this platform is going to be great, 
and then the unwary investor or speculator, uneducated, they, they don't really know what they're buying. They, they just, it sounds great, so they you know, put their you know, a few thousand dollars in, which is a significant amount of their life savings. And then the company just runs away with the money. Because it's in Bitcoin or Ethereum, it's so easy to run away with it. And so that, that's been happening quite a bit uh, of late. So, you know, I'm hearing more and more about blockchain and uh, from, from a healthcare perspective, more, more people are talking about it. And I just want to make sure I'm clear on how, how powerful it could be. And so the idea that I'm hearing is perhaps, you know, how there's multiple, so I live in Los Angeles, there's 140 hospitals in Los Angeles. Uh, I didn't know that till recently, but, uh, to connect all those hospitals and the records of those hospitals on a ledger where you can access that data and um, with clinics and pharmacies. For example, we have patients that may get their vaccine and they got it in the hospital and they, they may get the same vaccine six times or three times and we don't even know. So is that the idea? And, it, and if that's going to yes. happen, how does that happen? Yeah, so blockchain is great for the, these systems where there are so many parties that are, that are trying to track provenance of some record, you know, some data. Uh, sa same with like, you know, car registrations. Every state has theirs, but you know, when you sell a lemon in this state, the other states may not know about it. So, and, and with patient records too. And it's going down that road. And so blockchains are different from ICOs and tokens. You don't need a cryptocurrency for a blockchain. So that technology it is being developed for, for those use cases. But the scalability, so, so a few things are challenging. So scalability and, and privacy are two challenges with, with blockchains. Because by design, the original blockchains are not very scalable and they're not private, they're transparent. So it's adding you know, the privacy and scalability aspect that can work with the you know, healthcare use case, insurance use case, yeah, different enterprise use cases. And I think Tim probably addressed some of them and he, he is very familiar with with that space. I actually had a question about how to solve payments in the healthcare industry because when you look at how much payment delays are happening between hospitals, payers, patients, and how much is right now wasted in the industry on write-offs, how would you apply the technology to, you, to solve that and kind of disrupt the industry? Do you want to take that? Yeah, um, I would put you in touch off, I mean, we could talk about this later, but I could put you in touch with like GEM, that's something that they've looked specifically at down in LA. Um, unfortunately, to have the ability to use this technology and actually use it for, actually create utility, you have to be experts on payments too. And what happens with a lot of these companies is they don't know the first thing about payments. Uh, there's actually, there's 3,200 payment companies on AngelList right now. So there's a lot of people trying to do stuff with payments, but most of them apparently don't know how to do it. I'm happy to chat with you afterwards about like that one company that maybe be able to do it in the red shirt with the nice scarf. Um, so I recently was talking to an investor in Bitcoin um, has like different sectors of coin, but the one he want me to help him is the cancer coin, uh, which is the idea of trying to eradicate cancer fields uh, to different countries. And the reason for that is because I'm a stage four cancer survivor, I can provide a lot of insight. Um, and I couldn't get access to um, innovative approaches, even though I was connected to the professor at the time I was diagnosed with my cancer. So that was you know very personal to me. And I'm not an expert in blockchain, but I'm passionate about helping this happen. And I'm just kind of curious about you guys' opinions, like, because I think it's like a whole um, different sectors of chains, um, and a lot of my focus on social impact, the one I'm going to help them is cancer chain, uh, cancer coin. I don't know, this is the one that you're talking about? This is something different. So if you want some years. quick advice, I would introduce you to Fenwick and West, their law firm out here, and they could tell you whether or not you're going to structure it and get yourself into some, some trouble. So you could have all the goodwill in your heart. I'm not, I don't want to take that away and that passion you have, but there's a lot of laws that exist in how you structure these things uh, from a security standpoint. So happy to talk to you about that afterwards. That's my thought. What about you, Danny? So 
there, earlier in this meeting, the question was, what is the problem worth solving? So I'm, my question to you is, what is the problem worth solving with ICOs and you know, blockchain technology? OK, so, a good question. So, so ICOs are basically a new way of fundraising for a company or, or for some, some application. Well, blockchains are a new technology that can be, and doesn't need a, a coin. Um, so, so blockchain is more, for us, I mean, I guess we, we call it, uh, some people also call it decentralized ledger technology, but it's, a, it's sort of like a database, distributed database, but not exactly. Uh, well, the ICO is, a, is this new fundraising mechanism, uh, and it's unclear about the regulations around that fundraising, or crowdsourcing, it's, it's a crowdsourcing way. So that means that your fundraising can be global? Yes. So, by, by design, ICOs are global, and it's it's hard to, and it's also hard to prevent people from, from I guess con contributing to your ICO, the way most of them are done, and or you can limit. So some ICOs say you know U.S. citizens cannot participate, or or if you are a U.S. citizen, you want to participate, you have to be a credit investor, and you have to do you know KYC, know your customer. However, it's really hard to limit when it gets to the secondary markets, these, to these decentralized tokens, who actually buys, buys them. So, it's, it's a, so that's why regulation around fundraising with ICOs is, is pretty tricky. Hey, thanks guys, thanks for being here. Um, so my understanding is that at a federal level, uh, blockchain type technology uh, in terms of uh, banking systems is, is, not, uh, is not very kosher. Um, uh, maybe for smaller banks, um, they're able to uh, use that technology, for example, in a marijuana sales space, um, whereas uh, chartered banks perhaps are a little bit more weary of it. Is anybody, does anyone uh, sell marijuana through oh. uh, blockchain type technology that you're aware so, of? <laughs> I do. I, so I, I would say this addresses, I mean, it's, it's the blockchain versus ICOs thing again. So blockchain technology, all the big banks are, have teams working on that technology. But they're not supporting Bitcoin or Ethereum because of basically, um, I mean, the, the, these public uh, coins are used for anything and everything. So it, it's the technology for basically doing proper press, you know, AML is not there yet. But I guess my specific my question specifically has to do with the way uh, marijuana sales can be processed so that you can meet the guidelines, the federal guidelines, there since are, they're legal in states. There are high risk. There are merchant processors in the Bay Area that, that handle high risk clients, such as the ones you described. There, one is called Metal Pay, uh, run by Marshall Hainer. Uh, you can check them out. Thank I'm you. Not that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was curious um, because I hadn't made the distinction between ICO and sort of blockchain technology in the past, and so I'm glad to, to learn about that. Um, my question is, what are the legal hurdles about utilizing blockchain? Obviously, from my standpoint, it'd be nice to have the patient's medical record transparent amongst all physicians, and that's one of my goals. Um, how? You know, what are we going to run into as we try to create this? Because I think this is something that in the telemedicine industry we're, we're going to try to do. Um, what hurdles we're going to run into? Are there legal issues? I would say it's the, uh, so yeah, legal regulatory side, there will be some hurdles, but also user interface. So blockchains are not very usable right now. And, you know, uh, electronic health records are also, is, you know, it's hard to design a usable system. So, so okay, it'll, so, so yeah. Specifically, uh, these things are called private keys. Like, if a user has to control that, like traditionally, it's the institutions that hold that. And if, if you try to create some kind of self-sovereign network, if you lose those keys, you no longer have access to your own health records. I'm sorry for your loss. I mean, that's it's unfortunate. Right. Okay. I'll have to get into it further with you. Thank you. I thank you for presenting. This is a you know hot topic, obviously. Again, just trying to understand how blockchain will work with medical records. I mean, I understand that it's very secure. There's layer upon layer. But for a complete lay person who doesn't understand this, I mean, how can we understand blockchain and how it could be integrated with medical record? 
So there, there's a startup called uh, Tyrion that worked with Philips uh, to handle clinical data. Um, according to the story, uh, when you're going through the clinical trials, if there's any disputes about whether or not data has been tampered with, you may have to start from the beginning or it's completely scratched out and you lose millions, maybe even up to a billion dollars for some of these drug trials. So the, the pitch at this time uh, is, hey, if you can create completely um, transparent provenance from the from the beginning, the trial starts all the way through its different phases to the execution of whatever these drugs are or whatever, um, and you could tell exactly who did what when through you know, digital signatures effectively, then the, the dream is that you could uh, be able to not only assuage uh, some a regulator like the FDA, but also the consumers in, in the doctors who end up prescribing it to consumers. That the ideal world? Yeah. Yeah. We're done here, guys. <laughs> no, any, any other questions? I got another one. So, so setting aside all of the, the scams, I, I kind of compare it to the late 90s dot com uh, boom. There was a lot of uh, IPOs of companies that were flimsy and kind of blew away, but there was also Amazon.com and some other real use cases and real substantial lasting companies that came out of that. Um, you know, tulip bulb frenzy of the late 90s. So, so going back to the, the topic of your talk, <laughs> sort of setting aside all the scam stuff, but the topic of your talk is how to raise $100 million in an ICO for a healthcare startup, right? And I'm not sure that we got a clear answer on how to do that. Is this something that is an alternative to an IPO for, a, for like a succeeding healthcare startup with traction? Could they do an ICO instead and raise $100 million? I, I think soon. I think soon. And how they would they can. do that? Right now, the regulation is quite unclear. So, the companies that are doing it, and so the, the early companies were just the startups. They basically have very little to lose. Uh, but now you're seeing some companies that have real revenues and real businesses starting to figure out how to do an ICO. And so, they are working with lawyers who are also trying to figure out the proper way to structure it so that it basically, you know. Like, like you know, two or three years down the road, the SEC won't come after them for something improper. Yeah, so if I could just add a little bit of context in there. So, uh, so Dennis is probably my best friend through, uh, through uh, graduate school in there. So I was thinking about this, you know, that this American dog. So we actually need to raise probably, you know, half a billion to a billion dollars some money today. So I was reading all these things. I got excited. I think this seems a very efficient way using ICO to raise a lot of money for our insurance there. Then I started chatting with Danny. I think the, it definitely is just like, there's some possibility, like I was saying, but it's really dangerous right now, especially the, like regulatory, like, like as Tim says, like your chance of going to jail is really, really high. <laughs> it's really, it's really high. So. But there's no denying that the ICO fundraising mechanism is, is yeah. gonna be here to stay and more people will be doing it, both good and bad you know, purposes. I guess maybe ask one final question, maybe. Richard? I think it would be really helpful if you guys somehow make a better effort explaining to people the difference between the broad technology bit, you know, that behind Bitcoin, the blockchain technology. ICO is a methodology for raising money versus you know, blockchain is a very complex, computational, heavy technology that's not practical for a lot of things. And I think people sometimes get mixed those two together and get very confused. So. Okay, thank you so much. I can ask you one final question. So, I mean, the Bitcoin is, is going all over the place, right? So, I mean, a lot of people say if they're only putting some money in there, they make quite a bit. So, will you personally put money into Bitcoin now? Maybe both of you. There's no short, quick answer to that. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I can't give advi investment advice. Uh, okay, but it's complicated. The, the market is complicated. I would say you really should educate yourself on. But you're the expert. We just want to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know your risk thresholds in okay. which. How about we're pretty, yeah. pretty yeah. Res high risk? <laughs> then you should do it. <laughs> I can't. I can't answer that. Anything yeah. you put in there, you'll lose. So that's, that's what you should go. Maybe you do make some money. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. And that was, that was amazing.